12 people always liking my post. Y'all want anything from the gas station? I'm going to put everything back. Put it back exactly where you found it? Yes, I'm going to put it back exactly where I found it. Do the thing. I can't. Stop thinking about it and just do it. I don't have it totally figured out yet. Learn on the go. I don't want to mess it up. But messing up is how we learn. Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? Oh, I don't like to speak of things before they're finished, mm. um, but it's um, so far a masterpiece, if I do say so myself. Be one month, could be two months. Three months. Could be four months. I see that happening. Yes. Eight months. That's a realistic timeline. At first, I was like, ah! <laughs> But now that I've had time to absorb it, it's all working out. <laughs> Keep doing this forever. It's been 20 seconds. Come check this. The best way to get something done, if you, if it holds near and dear to you that you uh, um, like to be able to, anyway. Looking for a sign? This is it. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. That, this came out great. This really came out great. <laughs> All right, sit down. Sit down, sit down. Oh, I appreciate you guys a lot. I appreciate you, appreciate you so much. And yeah, I am mad at you, Josh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll forgive you. I'm a Christian. Uh, <clears throat> So my name is Jeremy. I'm the pastor of New Mountain Church. I'm glad you guys are here. This is the grand opening, and it's grand, that's for sure. Uh, we worked all the bugs out earlier this morning when nothing was working, and now everything seems to be working. So we're good. We're good to go. Uh, so uh, I wanted to um, kind of start off with talking a little bit about uh, uh, something very, very important to me. And so I, actually, Josh, I need your help. And Jim, I need your help. So we did this earlier uh, today. Uh, you know, every grand opening needs a ribbon cutting ceremony, right? All right. So I'll call my wife up here. She's coming up. Yeah, I could, you know, yeah, you could just put it out in front. Uh, I'm gonna have her cut the ribbon uh, because she's awesome, and uh, this wouldn't have happened without her, anyways. And today is our 18th anniversary. So. <laughs> So, you have the honors. Yeah! 
I was slightly afraid that she was going to stab me. <laughs> she does not like to get up here in front of all you guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, I want to ask a question. Uh, some of you younger people might know this. What is a goat? No, not a four-legged animal. Come on, what is a goat? Greatest of all time. Greatest of all time. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're, you're hoping for some goat cheese or something, right? No, this is the greatest of all time. So, who's the greatest boxer of all time? Ali. Ali. Jake, Paul. <laughs> Jake Paul. Oh, get out. Uh, who is the greatest baseball player of all time? Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. What, what is about being great that's so important to us as humans? We always strive for that. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, even the American goal is you rise the corporate ladder, right? You, you inflate your career. You get a bigger house. You get more prestige. You, you get more money, bigger bank account, all this different kinds of stuff. What is about us wanting to become greater than the person next to us? What is that that's deep within us? You know, there's heavy metal bands that... I've only seen it in the last 15 years or 20 years or so, but heavy, heavy metal bands will have, you know, the drummer, the bass player, heavy guitars, long hair, tattoos, but then the lead singer has this new thing called an ego riser. It's just a small little square that's on the, the front of the stage that he jumps on. He goes, ah, and it just puts him up taller than everybody else. It's called, it's actually called, Google it, it's actually called an ego riser. I would like to propose nobody needs an ego riser. None of us as humans need our ego inflated. Uh, this is something that we actually battle against is our ego or the, the want to become greater or better than our neighbor or our friend or somebody that we know. We, we are supposed to, as Christians, actually go the opposite and come down humbly and serve others and love others, even those that are unlovable. So, uh, we started a new tradition here at New Mountain Church. We do something now, what's called, where we stand up for the reading of God's Word. You guys go with that? If you've got legs, use them. If you don't have legs, just uh, straighten up in your seat. So, this is Luke 9, starting at 46. Luke 9, starting at 46. It says this, An argument arose among them as to which of them was greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. And John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you so much, Lord, for this, this big blessing that is this building, this room, this, uh, this place of worship, Lord, this gathering place. We, we give it back to you, Lord. You gave it to us, but we give it back to you in worship. Lord, we give you all the honor and all the glory for this. We know that without you, none of this would be possible. And so, Lord, we thank you for today. We pray that you would speak to us today through your word and help us today to conform to it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, maybe seated. Cool. Let's go back. Let's look at it. You got your holy cell phones? You got your holy Bibles? I don't know what else it could be. And somebody have an iPad? If somebody has a desktop in here, I'm going to be very weirded out by that. <laughs> Let's look at this. Let's look back at it. Luke 9, 46. It says, An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. Now, Spurgeon, I always quote from Spurgeon. He's an old school theologian from way back in the day. Been dead a long time. But he has some serious wisdom on the biblical topics. This is what Spurgeon says. They probably thought in terms of position and advancement in the glorious administration of Messiah, the king. He spoke of abasement, and they thought of their own advancement, and that at the same time. What's, what Spurgeon's getting at is that just a few verses before this, Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, I'm going to be delivered into the hands of men. I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to go to the cross. And what they're thinking is, 
Oh, you're going to the cross, uh, so which one of us is taking over? Which one of us is going to be the greatest? Which one of us is going to be the one that's in control? This is what they're thinking. And it's, it goes along with his, historical context because back in the day, back in the ancient Jewish tradition, the rabbis, the, the, the teachers of the time, they would have 12 disciples. They would actually get 12 disciples, these Jewish people. And it was because of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so they, they would get these 12 disciples and as the rabbi would start to get up in age and eventually pass on, there would have to be one disciple that would take the ministry. They would kind of take the reins. And that disciple is actually known as the greatest disciple. It's the one who is going to keep it going. And so these guys are thinking, okay, Jesus, he's talking about dying over here. <clears throat> so which one of us is going to be the, the greatest disciple? Which one of us is going to be the one in charge? Which one of us is going to be the one who calls the shots? This is what they're thinking. And I, could, I, I imagine it was not cordial and nice. I, I totally know that you know, John wasn't like, Peter, thou art thy greatest. I'm sure it was like, Peter, you're about as dumb as a rock. Jesus called you a rock, but you're about as dumb as a rock. I'm sure it was more like that because they were, they were bickering about it, it says. They were disputing about it. And you might say, well, well good. They probably learned from it this time, right? Nope. <laughs> Luke 22, they do the same thing again. Um, but, you know, when I'm thinking about uh, the grand opening, and I really wanted to tell the story of how New Mountain started, I think about what I feel like could have been going around, whispers and, you know, talking behind backs and stuff like that. It could have been like, well, why would you need to start a church? Why would you need to start a new church? There's churches on every corner. Do you think you're better than X, Y, or Z church? Do you think you're better than that church on the corner? And my answer to that is absolutely not. And I want to show you um, the story of New Mountain Church kind of in, in, in picture form. And I want to use mountains because... There's a few different ways that mountains are made, but three of them we're going to look at today really co correspond with exactly how New Mountain started. So the first one is going to be a volcano. You guys seen a volcano? I actually went to Hawaii with Amy one time. We saw lava. Liquid hot magma. Or liquid hot magma, as Dr. Evil says. And, I, and you know what I'm thinking? As... As me, I was a pastor at Vertical Church for, for a long time. One of them, I, I was on staff there. I really felt this call to start the church. I felt God calling me to do this. And I talked to Amy about it, and I, I, tried, to, I tried to, you know, reassure her that we would not fail and burn, you know, crash and burn, you know, totally ruin it. But she was very afraid of it. But I, I had this pressure building up that I felt like the Lord was calling us to do this. Almost like that volcano tour, I just, I just had to go for it. I had to do it, and hopefully lava don't fall on anybody, but I, I had to do it. I had to start this church. God had given me a vision to start this church, uh, a purpose for it, and even how to do it. It was this, this buildup of pressure. And so this is the story of how it kind of went. As working as a pastor at Vertical Church for many years, I, I really started feeling a, a certain way to do it, and, and I, wanted, I wanted to start this church and have it really deep in the Bible. So if you've been coming to New Mountain for any length of time, you, sh you know that we go through a lot of scripture, and you know, I'm sorry for it, not sorry for it, but uh, this is what we do. We go through large portions of scripture, and the other pillar or leg of New Mountain Church is that we're deep in community. It means we value fellowship, we value eating together. That's why there's food after the service, by the way, it's Holy Smokes barbecue tonight, right? So I, I really, you know, little, little, little side story, Holy Smokes Barbecue was our first ever meeting place as New Mountain Church. Met their first, the first time ever. When was that, like August of last year or something crazy long ago? Like, it, I, can't, I can't keep track of time. I'm so, you know, scatterbrained. But um, yeah, so, so food is a big deal because food opens up conversation. Conversation opens up friendships. Friendships open up help and, 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 you know, support systems. And so that's very, very important. And uh, uh, alongside that, discipleship is absolutely important for the church. 
And so that's our pillars. That's our two big deals of New Mountain Church is deep in the Bible, deep in community. That's what we're, we're all about. Now, when I, oh, I felt that call to do this, I told Amy about it, and she said, absolutely not. We cannot do that. And if I would have known what I know now, I probably would have said, you're right. You're very right, woman. But I didn't. I just pushed through, and I, I said, it's, you know, this is what we're called to do. And so <clears throat> I started drawing like a... <clears throat> little uh, uh, logos and of whatnot. And I, at first, the name was going to be East Mountain Church. I decided that. I, said, I thought that would be cool, East Mountain Church. And so it was because I wanted, to, I wanted to meet out in the foothills because, you know, I thought that would be the best place. But ultimately, there was no place to meet out there. And so instead of calling it East Mountain, I, just, I, I started to call it New Mountain. But I... Uh, I told my bosses at Vertical Church. I, I met with them and I, I laid it all out on the table, you know, what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, they could have very well got mad and say, well, you get out of here now, you're fired. But uh, they helped us to do that. And so what happened was um, that was the start of it. And, and as I came home from that meeting, I talked with Amy and I, I was waiting, you know, I didn't want her to blow up. So I was kind of calm and talking real slow. And, and, and she said, you wouldn't believe it, but I had a dream last night. I had a dream last night that I had a baby. And now we have an adult daughter. So having a baby right now is a nightmare, not a dream. <laughs> Keep that in mind. But she said she had this baby and the baby fit into the palm of her hand. And our daughter, Ariana, was there, and she said to Amy, she said, oh, the baby's middle name is Mountain. And uh, Amy said that the dream kept, kept going, and, and that only after a few months, the little baby was full-grown baby and, and starting to walk. And what's funny is that I told Amy, you wouldn't believe it, but I, I had the meeting with the guys. And she's like, what, you did? And, and, and I said, and I didn't even tell you, but... I've been thinking that the name of the church needs to be East Mountain Church, which you realize Mountain is the middle of East Mountain Church. Uh, and they said, I said, and, and you know what's even crazier is Jason and Danny told me that, you know, to start a church normally, it's going to take nine months, like having a baby. <laughs> and so Amy was like, oh, from that moment on, the Holy Spirit was like helping Amy just to just to go with it, you know, and so that was the, that was the start of it, that was the beginning of it, and then, you know, fast forward, now we're all the way in here in this new building, and, and, and things are going, going awesome, and it's, so it's, it's not about us being greater, it's about us following a call, that's what it's about, it's not about us doing church better, it's about us following a call, it's about us listening to the Lord and going for it, that's what it's all about, it's not about who's greater, and so let's look at another account of this same story. Let's look at Mark's eyewitness account of this uh, from, from his perspective. This is what Mark 9, 34 through 35 says. It says, but they kept silent for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and a servant of all. So he realized they were on the way to Capernaum. They were bickering about who is the greatest. Jesus sets them down and says, listen, if you want to be first, you must be last. You must be a servant of all. Jesus, just a few verses before this in Matthew 9, says, or in Luke 9, says that we must deny ourselves and take up our cross daily. There's a denial of ourselves. There's a, a, a laying ourselves down and lifting others up. There's sacrificing our selves for others. This is the Christian life. It goes totally against the culture of our time, the society of our time. It's completely opposite from that. This is what God's calling us to do, is to be humble, not to be proud, to be kind and compassionate, not to be arrogant. This is what God's calling us to be. And you know what? When I was, thinking, when I was writing this sermon, I started thinking about all these, these catchphrases, Right? I thought about this one. Was, it, this is what I said. I said, uh, it's not about who is the best, but who we can bless. I'm like, oh, that's cheese factory, man. Can't do that. Can't say that. You cannot say that. That's not right. And then the next one that came to my mind was, oh, this, this would be good. Lay down our egos and become someone's hero. <laughs> Come on, Jeremy. Keep thinking. 
And so then I did come up with one that I th- thought was great, and, and I slightly stole it, so that's probably why it's great, because it's not mine. But this is what it says. We need to lay down our ladders and pick up our crosses. Now that's good. That's good. We need to lay down our ladders and pick up our crosses. You might say, I don't, I don't have those needs. I don't have those wants in life. I don't have those urges just to become better. I beg to differ. I've seen most of your Instagrams. We all want to seem better than we are. We, we all want to look better than we are. It's, it's deep within the human structure. And I would say that we need to lay down that ladder and pick up that cross, just like Jesus said. It's not about being greater. In fact, nobody's great. Nobody's good enough. Let's just look at it. Let's just run through the Bible and let's see, okay? How about this? Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. That's just mean. That's just mean. Joseph was abused. Moses had a st- 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 stuttering problem. You like that? Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair. I feel very attacked right now. But he was also a womanizer. Uh, Rahab was a a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elisha was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. I want to promise you guys, I will never preach naked. (laughs) Promise. Not going to happen. Okay? That's what you should be applauding right there. Yeah. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer. And Lazarus was dead. Not anymore. Not anymore. It seems to me like God doesn't use people that are great. I mean, think about Goliath. In our culture, Goliath would be the guy. Goliath would would be like Josh's favorite boxer, Jake Paul. (laughs) You like that? Goliath would be like one of those great baseball players that are roided up, you know, and hitting home runs every other hit. Goliath would be the guy for us in culture today. Not for God. God just used David. There's a few little stones in a sling. God wants to use those who are incapable because it shows his glory in the fact that he makes them capable. Do you ever feel that? I can't do it. I'm not smart enough. I can't tell somebody the gospel because I can't remember all that stuff. Well, good, because God can Oh, I can't help somebody through their, their time of crisis because I just don't have the, I don't have the uh, emotions to, to deal with that. Well, good. That puts you right in line with somebody that God would use. It's somebody who can't because God can. I remember a time back in the day when I worked for Amy's uncle who was a plumber. I was a plumber's apprentice, Dennis. Uh, and this was B.C. Do you know what B.C. is? Before Christ. Before Christ. <laughs> So we'd go to the bar after work. That's what construction guys do. And uh, we'd play pool every once in a while, and you'd, you'd, you'd put your quarters on the table, and there'd be some different guys playing, and eventually your, t- your turn would come up. And there was this one guy that would always be playing there that he would go grab a pool stick off the wall, and he'd put it on the table, and he'd roll it. You know, most people would roll it on the table to see which one's the straightest stick, right? He would roll this stick, and he would pick the one that was the most goofy, warped stick, you know, which it didn't have a a straight part on it, you know. And this pool player would, like, beat everybody with this crooked stick. And he's like, I can't use straight sticks. I can't do it, you know. I I need a a warped one. I need a crooked stick. And, you know, back when I was working for plumbing with, with Amy's Uncle Dennis, uh, I didn't get it until I became a pastor later on. I, I could see the, the philosophy in that, you know, where, where the Lord, he uses crooked sticks. He shoots straight shots with warped sticks. And I can attest to that because I'm not able. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. 
back in the day, I used to, I used to hound and bother Albert back there on the job site. I, I worked uh, for, for Amy's dad, Bob. I worked glazing, and uh, that's windows, if you don't know. And, and after work, you know, me and some guys and, and Albert we walk, would be talking, and I'd just be like, oh, well, you're a Christian? Oh, what about dinosaurs? Oh, you're a Christian? Well, what about UFOs? Like, I'd just say the dumbest stuff ever. I mean, if you have those questions, you're not dumb. I was just dumb. But, but what I remember about Albert is that he was gracious to me. He didn't say, oh, Jeremy, you're just about as dumb as a toad. He was like, he just calmly answered my questions. and He didn't make me feel stupid. And he, 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 he was showing his love, a Christian love. And, and I didn't get it back then. I was just kind of, wow, he's kind of different. What is wrong with this? Is he drinking in his trailer or something? What's going on with him? But now I know. Now I know. It's not about being great or being smart or being perfect or being Instagram happy. It's, it's about being who you are and realizing that God will work through you and that God is actually needing you to be humble, not proud, needing you to be humble and not wise past your own eyes. Like, he's needing that from you. If we keep going in Luke 9, it says this from 47 to 48. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Now, if you have a pen or a highlighter or a notebook, hopefully you have a notebook. We give them out for free. Uh, highlight or underline in my name, because we'll go back to that. But first off, something to look at in 47 was that he was knowing their hearts. Now, knowing their hearts brings me equal amounts of fear and joy. Because I'm happy that the Lord knows my heart. He knows my thoughts. He, he knows what I want before I even understand I want it. He knows what I'm going to pray before I pray it. I am very ha happy and thankful that God knows my heart. But then he also, he knows my heart. And heart's deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And my heart's wicked at times. And, I, and I, my desires are off base sometimes. And man, he knows it. He knows it. The, this is what a, a, a commentator says. His name was Pate. He says, the principle being established by Jesus was that in the kingdom of God, there is a reversal of values involved. The last will be first and the least will be the greatest. And you notice that Jesus brings the little child up. He brings the little kid up. And, and it's, it's definitely stark contrast to just a few verses before this when Satan was indwelling in a child. And Jesus brings this kid up. And you might think, well, why does he do that? To show, he, he's using this picture to show that this is how we have to be. Not a big bad warrior, but like a child. You might say, well, why is he using that kind of a picture? Why is he using that illustration as a child? Think about this. Our children trust us, at least till they get to a certain age. Our, our children need us. This is why he's using that picture. This, this child, especially back in these days, this child had no rights. He had no authority. And Jesus is saying, if you receive this little child, you receive me. If you receive me, you receive him who sent me. It's an example that he's given us. Think about this. I'm sure you might think of it. You might wonder this. Why are we called the bride of Christ? You don't have to answer that. I just got to tell you, I'm not wearing a dress. Because he's the bridegroom. Exactly. So it's not a sexual thing. It's not a relationship thing. What it is is a covenant between us and God. That's why we're called the bride of Christ because he's the bridegroom. Like she said, we're, the, we're in a covenant with God when, it, when we're being known as the bride of Christ. We are in a connected relationship. This is, this is what that means. Or how about this? Sheep. You ever heard that? Christians were called sheep, right? Some people don't like that term. Some people really don't like that term. And I got to say, sometimes after I've been working really hard, I smell like a sheep. But why does the Bible use that? 
that picture. Yeah, that's perfectly true. We have the great shepherd, and then even us as, as ministers, we're shepherds of congregations. We're shepherds of the flock, shepherds of sheep. But why are you called a sheep? It's not because you're furry and smell. It's because sheep need to be led. Sheep need to be cared for. Sheep need to be tended. Sheep need to be led to pasture. Sheep need to be led to water. This is the picture of the Christian. We're not doing it on our own. We're following. We're being led. We're being cared for along the way. That's why we're considered sheep. And so this is why Jesus is using the child so that they'll get it. It's not about being great. It's about being humble and lowly. So I always use theologians. I throw theologians up here. Let's throw up an atheist. This is an atheist poster boy, Frederick Nietzsche. You guys heard of him? He's got a great mustache, though, I got to say. I mean, Jared, the bass player from earlier today, he's got, he's got a good mustache, but this guy's going to. This is from a book that he wrote. <coughs> it says, what is good? Whatever augments the feeling of power, the will to power, power itself in man. What is evil? Whatever springs from weakness. What is happiness? The feeling that power increases, that resistance is overcome. Not contentment, but more power. Not peace at any price, but war. Not virtue, but efficiency. Virtue in the Renaissance sense. Virtue, virtue free of moral acid. The weak and the botched shall perish. First principle of our charity, and one should help them to it. What is more harmful than any vice? Practical sympathy for the botched and the weak. Christianity. It's pretty hardcore. Wherever Frederick's at right now, I don't want to be next to him. It's a little hot, sizzling a little bit. Luke 9, 49 through 50, it says this. This is the second part of, of what happened. Jesus answered, or John answered, sorry. Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. So immediately, there's something that connects those two pieces together. And guess what it is? It's the in your name. It's the in your name part. Uh, you realize that, that John says, we were trying to stop this guy from casting out demons. I'm like, John, he was casting out a demon. Why would you do that? Are you uh, sad for the demons or something? You know, oh, since Jesus has been on the scene, they've had a rough day. You know, No, like he was trying to stop them from casting out demons because they weren't a part of the clique. They weren't a part of the team. They weren't a part of the group. Oh, man. When I was reading through this, studying for this, I thought, man, my, just, my brain, you know, like in the cartoons, a little sizzle comes up above my head. Because exactly what was happening all those years ago with John happens all over our city today, all over our state and our country and even our world. You know what it is? It's tribal Christianity. It is a plague. Tribal Christianity means that, that there could be Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches that are segregated from other churches. This is my place over here. You can come in, but you can't leave. That's paganism. That's paganism. That's unholy. I know so many churches that want nothing to do with us. And it's sad. It brings me pain, and it, it really upsets me. But then I know many churches who are the opposite of that, that love us with open arms, that realize that we're a gospel-presenting, Bible-preaching church, and they're... They want to come alongside us. But I still can't get out of the back of my head how many other ones don't want nothing to do with us. Do you know how awkward that's going to be in heaven? Oh, I didn't want nothing to do with you on earth, but now that we're in heaven, let's hang out. What are you doing tonight? That's going to be very, very awkward. And then, you know, when, when, when I was thinking about my, my, my leaving the vertical church to start this church, this was the opposite of tribal Christianity that happened. And so it's the second mountain I want to show you, the second type of mountain. 
It's actually called a, a fold mountain. And it's where two big tectonic plates, or maybe you want to say continental plates, they, they butt up against each other and, and bang up against each other. How much you want to make a bet I can throw a football over the mountains? <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's where the plate goes underneath it and lifts the other one up. And that's how you get a mountain range sometimes. It's when these big underground plates and one goes, other, and one goes under one and, the, and it, it pops it up. And so what happened when I presented this idea to Jason and Danny over, for, over there at Vertical, they're my bosses, uh, I presented this fact that I wanted to leave and start a church. And they very well could have said, you need to pack up and leave now. We don't want you around. They could have very well said, you're fired. They could have done that, but they didn't. They said, we love you, we trust you, and we're going to help you. And they actually supported me and Amy for a good number of months leading up to this. They've helped us with little things here and there. They've helped us with that soundboard that we're using right now. It came from the vertical church. Uh, they, they've helped us. And even Jason uh, got us up on stage and said, if anybody wants to go with Jeremy and Amy, feel free to go. That is the opposite of tribal Christianity. That's him realizing that God is just calling us into two different spots. We were head bunting a little bit. Those plates were bumping up against each other. But instead of him crushing me, he lifted me up. That's cool. That's how it should be. There's nothing that says we all have to do church the exact same way. We're not supposed to. But there is the purpose of helping those to follow the call that they have from God. And that's what they did for me. That's what they did for us. Or how about this type of mountain? We know this type. Sand dunes. Anybody been to the dunes before? Yep. <laughs> Never seen those guys, though. Never seen them there. But when I think about this third type of mountain, it's essentially where wind and time uh, accumulate all these grains of sand into a large pile that become a dune. And if it was not for Stone Ridge and Emmanuel Baptist Church, we wouldn't have been able to meet until now. I searched this whole place, this whole town, looking for a place to meet. I even looked into rental facilities that we can just rent for Sundays only, and it was a nothing. It was a big zero. And so Stone Ridge, I, I had to force them to take a check from us because they just, they just wanted to bless us. They wanted to welcome us into their place to gather, to accumulate, to, to come together as a, as a new mountain. And they allowed that to happen. Uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church allowed us to meet at their place for leaders meetings, prayer teams, small group. Uh, if it wasn't for those two churches, we wouldn't have been able to start. If it wasn't for the vertical church and how they helped, we wouldn't have been able to start. If it wasn't for these, these, these brothers and sisters in Christ coming alongside us, we wouldn't have been able to start. It was because all this kind of help that we've had that we were able to do what we did. That's what's awesome. We are not against each other. We're on the same team. We need to lock arms and be unified as a, as a large body of Christ. Sure, we do things differently. We do, we do church a little bit differently. We, we have different emphasis on different things. That, and that's, that's true, but we shouldn't be separated. But there is times where Jesus says to separate. But something to keep in mind is that I wanted you to highlight that phrase, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Have you ever wondered that? I mean, when people pray, and at the end of their prayer, they say, in Jesus' name. Or, or when somebody's casting out a demon, like Sarah, Sarah does that all the time, and Danielle. Uh, you say, in the, I'm hoping you guys say, in Jesus' name. Yeah. What does that mean? In Jesus' name. Ever wonder that? What does that even mean? Back in the day, even in pagan Rome, back in the day, if the emperor would send out a messenger to a town or a village to deliver a message, as that messenger would get there, he would be called an, an ambassador or a representative. And as he would get to this place and deliver this message, he would do it in the name of the emperor. And did you know that if you were to kill said messenger, 
the penalty for doing that would be the same as if you killed an emperor. And when Jesus is using that, he's using it in the same way. He's saying that in my name, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, that means that we are representatives of Jesus. That means that we represent Christ wherever we go. I mean, think about this, Richie. Think about this. Your, your job comes up to you and says, we love you. We want to make you the face of our company. Well, that's that's kind of cool. I mean, if you like your company, I guess. You know, that's kind of cool. Oh, think about Biden comes up to you. Richie. We, <laughs> r- 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 Richie. Uh, 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 we want to make you the ambassador, the representative of America. That'd be kind of cool, right? You'd put on a suit. You'd comb your hair, right? You'd, you'd look nice for it. You'd be ready for it. Because that's, that's an honor. That's a big honor. And we think that's so awesome. Did you know that the king of glory says that we are representatives and that we come in his name? But why don't we act like it, though? We don't. We forget it or we overlook it. As a Christian, we are an ambassador of Christ. We're a representative of Christ. And wherever we go, we are an example of Christ to other people. We might feel unworthy. Good, because that's who Jesus uses. We might think we can't because we don't know enough. We don't, we don't do enough. We don't serve enough. We don't you know, get involved enough. Whatever it is, good, because Jesus can do that for you. Jesus can put you in that way. Uh, the Holy Spirit can help you through that. This is what it means to be in Jesus' name. But that's the point. That's the key part, in Jesus' name. Because there's others in the Bible that said that exact phrase. Let's look at it. Matthew 7, 15 to 23. It says this. This is Jesus talking. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And cast out demons in your name. And do mighty, many mighty works in your name. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's more than just praying a prayer that you believe in Jesus. It's a lifestyle change. It's a humbling. It's a laying down of yourself and a picking up of the cross. It's a complete change. And the Lord will do it. That's the good news. We're unable to change ourselves. But God can. He can change us. He can make us into the true, awesome representative that we're meant to be. Because listen to me, Christian in here today. There is no other option. You are a representative of Christ. Are you a good one or a bad one? Take a moment, evaluate yourselves. The Bible tells us to, to kind of analyze ourselves to see if we're within the faith. Are you a good representative or a bad representative? I know we've all seen bad politicians. Um, I've heard, though, that there was a good politician at one time. Don't know, you know much about him. But are you a good representative or a bad representative? Or the third option, are you not a representative at all? Are you a representative of darkness? I hope not, because this is what it, what it means. For Christians, you're either on the good team or the bad team. That's how it goes. Uh, I, I'm not, not just for Christians. This is for every single person on the planet. You're either in the good team or the bad team. You're either a Christian or you're not. And I pray that today you will look inward and see yourself, look at your soul, evaluate yourself. I want to call a band to come up. I want you to to take account of uh, of your life and how fleeting it is, how fast it goes by, 
How easy it is to not make it another day. I pray that for you in here today, I pray that if you're a Christian, you will turn from being a poor representative into being a, a, an active, powerful representative of Christ. If you're not a Christian in here today, I pray that today would be the last day that you walk out those doors as an unbeliever. And I pray that today would be the day that you change, that you finally give up and you let your ego down and, and you pick up your cross, that you realize that the way you're living is going to lead to damnation, it's going to lead into pain and suffering, it's going to lead even into problems on this planet. But there's a way, there's a, there's a way that's been made for us through Christ and through what he's done on the cross. Where he's paid that ultimate price. He's become that ransom for us. He's become that payment, that sacrifice to where when we trust in him, there's a transfer that takes place where he gives us his righteousness and essentially we give him our sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death there's new life in Christ so that's what I want to pray for right now is if you don't know Christ please lay down your pride lay down the, the want to handle business to take control and realize that that he can get you through anything that happens and if you are a Christian in here today I want to pray for clean slates I want to pray for second chances I want to pray for power.